Tenacoto Katoa, my name is Joel Colón Rios. I am director of the New Zealand Center for Public Law and professor of law at Victoria University of Wellington. This is the first episode of the Lives in New Zealand Public Law series, uh, an initiative of the New Zealand Center for Public Law. In each episode, we will interview an individual who in some way has participated in shaping the public law of this country. Today, I have the honor to talk to Sir Kenneth Kiss. We will talk about his early life and education, his role in the judiciary and in law reform domestically and internationally. Then I call Sir Kenneth, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you. So I wanted to start just by asking some questions about your early life and, mm -hmm. and education. Um, can you tell us something about your childhood and about your time at Auckland um, Grammar School? Well, I, I started school um, in 1942 in a, a, primary, a primary school um, in Auckland. And then um, I was at Howick District High School and we had great primary school teaching. This is the time of the BB reforms or the BB Fraser re reforms, thinking of the marvelous statue outside here of Peter Fraser. He was Minister of Education. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that we were in the middle of a war, uh, we had uh, great education. And, and then I, I went to Auckland Grammar, which was the closest um, state school to where we lived uh, on the outskirts of Auckland. And there had uh, a very strong uh, teaching in uh, sort of classical subjects, really, uh, Latin and French and English and maths and, um, and chemistry. I chose over history at some point. So it was a very, very good schooling with very good teachers, teachers who were tremendously able in both primary and secondary schools. And why, why did you decide to study law and, and how would you describe your life as a law student in the 1950s? Um, well, there, there didn't seem to be a lot of choices um, in terms of quite what people might do. I, I, would have, I suppose I could have qualified for medical school because I had some pretty strong science. Uh, but at some point, um, a senior magistrate, um, senior now district court judge, um, who was a friend of ours said, what about law? And so I made that choice. Uh, law school at that time was part-time. Uh, so we did um, five years, uh, a five-year degree, the first year of which was in art subjects, and that was full-time. But the rest, uh, the whole of my law degree was uh, part-time. Uh, and, and it was only when I went for graduate work uh, in the United States some years later that I had a full-time year as a law student. So, uh, and that was pretty standard. I mean, the part-time part was pretty standard at that time. And so you were admitted to the bar in 1961. Yes. Um, um, all lawyers, um, they have their favorite stories about their first day or <coughs> days in court. Can you share um, yours with, with us? Well, my first, first day in court was way back in 1957 when I was a clerk in the traffic court or, or in the police court or in the domestic proceedings court. Um, my first <coughs> day on my feet um, as, as counsel in a court was in the International Court of Justice mm -hmm. in 1973. Uh, but in between, I, had, I did have those several years of clerking courts um, in the magistrate's court and got a good sense then of uh, what, how court processes worked. Well, when, when I came to external affairs, I, I still had the end of my law degree to complete. Uh, so again, I was a part-time law student. Um, and, and then for the first time, I got a sense of legal process, of the way in which government worked and, and the way in which there were all these interrelationships between various parts of law. Uh, I'd, I'd had, I suppose, a reasonably um, good legal education at Auckland, but, but it was just a whole set of rules. I didn't have any sense of process. But at External Affairs, I did get a, a real sense of the way in which government worked, the way in which parliament worked, the way, the way in which the world worked as well. The department at that stage was only um, uh, 17 years old. It was created during the war in 1943. 
about the time I started primary school. <laughs> and uh, so that was um, a real eye opener. And, um, and I've, you know, and I, th I think it's something that uh, is critically important that people do see the law as a whole and, and do understand the way in which it uh, gets developed and um, gets clarified. Um, well, well, I wrote a major paper for Professor Richard Baxter on political treaties, and and that was a, a really challenging task because I looked at um, treaties of alliance, for instance, treaties of peaceful settlement, and so on, from I think the Anglo-Portuguese alliance of sometime in the 15th century, on through um, arguments through the the interwar period, and so on, um, and probably including the Suez Crisis and so on. Um, uh, and, and so that, that was uh, a very important um, piece of work uh, because it told me that I had to go into great detail and that was something I'd learned in external affairs as well, as well as having these much larger ideas about the way the whole enterprise worked. Uh, I, I did um, courses at Harvard in a range of public law subjects, apart from including international law, uh, with uh, uh, with with Baxter, as I said, uh, in two seminars, one on the law of armed conflict uh, and the other on international civil aviation law. And in one or other of those, there was uh, a student, Tom Bergenthal, um, who was a Holocaust survivor, and and who was the member of the international court I knew best um, when I when I got to um, the international court some years later. Uh, and so in one of those seminars, there were three future judges of the international court out of about seven or eight people, mm -hmm. uh, Baxter and Bergenthal and me. But there was also great teaching in constitutional law, administrative law. I took, uh, I went to Lon Fuller's um, courses uh, as to, to audit, not for credit, a uh, very good course by Benjamin Kaplan and copyright. So a whole wide range of subjects which reinforce my view that um, law, so far as you can, has to be looked at uh, as a whole thing and not sliced into a whole lot of different subjects. And I understand um, that that your time at Harvard had an impact on your views about um, a New Zealand Bill of Rights. Can you comment on, on that? Yes. Well, in, in 1960, there was a proposal by the by National Party, the National Party then in opposition, that they would introduce three changes. Um, uh, one was um, improving the system for the control of regulation making. A second was from for a citizen's protector, which led to the Office of Ombudsman in 1962. Uh, and, and the third was a Bill of Rights based on the, uh, the bill it, which had been passed just very recently in Canada during the Diefenbaker government. And a large number of submissions were made to the parliamentary committee on that. Uh, and uh, they were made by the Solicitor General of the day later Chief Justice Sir Richard Wilde, by the Law Society, by the New Zealand Maori Council, by people from political science, public administration, economics and law here. And almost all of us, including me, were opposed to the Bill of Rights uh, because we feared that it would give the court the kind of powers that um, had been exercised by the US Supreme Court during the New Deal and earlier in respect of employment legislation. And we didn't think that was for a role for the courts. We also thought we also thought that the New Zealand Parliament was sufficiently accessible and sufficiently sensitive to public opinion that it would, um, on the whole, do the right thing. It had, for instance, just abolished the death penalty um, in 1961. It was passing important changes to family law and so on. Uh, it, it was where we thought law should be made, not not by non-elected judges. But when I was at Harvard, uh, just the following year, um, Professor Freund in constitutional law took us through major recent decisions of the US Supreme Court, which were 
about the processes of government, to come back to that point, not about the substance. And so the processes were protecting voters' rights, the major case about gerrymandering, Baker and Carr, uh, about um, the right to freedom of speech, uh, New York Times and Sullivan, about the right uh, of association. Uh, and the, so their processes writ large, to use language that became popular later as a result of the work of John Hart Ely, uh, and also processes writ small, the individual uh, charged with a criminal offence uh, had the right to be informed in various ways and had the right to legal counsel. So I, th I thought that a Bill of Rights that was narrowly designed to protect um, those process rights uh, uh, could be introduced. Um, it would not be deciding on major issues of substance, for instance, on um, end of life or abortion or matters of that kind. It would be concerned with how things got done, um, but not about what they produced, not concerned with process rather than product. And that, that, <clears throat> that was very influential in my thinking and in the uh, draft Bill of Rights that was prepared uh, in 1985. Well, it was a, I mean, in some ways, it was a very sharp contrast to 1964. You know, 1964, although the Vietnam War was starting to go bad in various ways, um, in ter terrible ways, um, it, it was the time of the great society of Johnson's great success. 1968 is the year in which um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, the Prague Spring was crushed, um, <clears throat> and I joined the um, a part of the Office of Legal Affairs concerned with the codification and development of international law, headed by a Russian and with a very good Czech colleague. So relationships within that division were pretty strained, <laughs> with the Czech insisting that uh, all his communications with his Russian boss were to be in English, no longer in Russian, <laughs> which was to my advantage, obviously. Uh, and, and so in terms of <clears throat> decolonization, uh, there was the, um, the work being done at that time on treaty succession. So I did um, a lot of research, again, a lot of detailed research about the ways in which uh, international air transport agreements um, or extradition agreements or trade agreements or international labour conventions were to be treated in, at the time of um, this rapid decolonisation. Uh, and I, I thought at the time that this was sort of after the event because much of the world had become decolonised, but then the issues arose later, um, at, including at the time I was at the International Court. So. So some of these issues arising from the breakup of countries or, or, or independence movements uh, were prominent. And, and New Zealand was prominent in that area as well because of New Zealand's responsibilities in the early 60s for um, Western Samoa and then in the mid 60s in, in respect of uh, the Cook Islands and Niue with Tokelau still remaining on that list. In terms of the Cold War issues, there was a process um, that began in 1960 and ended in 1970 on United, United Nations Day, 24 October 1970, when the Declaration on uh, Friendly Relations and Cooperation Among States was adopted unanimously. And that was <clears throat> a, a very carefully elaborated text that worked away at um, dealing with Russian or Soviet bloc claims for peaceful coexistence, supplemented and became friendly relations rather than peaceful coexistence, supplemented by obligations in respect of cooperation. So it was a very active and interesting time. And it also involved looking at um, who should do what, and what matters could be handled by the, by the independent uh, te rather technical or scientific work of the International Law Commission, a group of independent scholars and practitioners, and what matters had to be dealt with through international um, political processes. 
uh, an issue that arose uh, in, in the um, late 50s and then again in the late 60s in respect of the law of the sea, where the law of the sea was partly dealt with, substantially dealt with earlier by the International Law Commission on the basis of the International Law Commission drafts, but then later had to be dealt with uh, through a much wider political process as the world moved towards 200 mile zones of one kind or another. Um, well, it, it was an initiative um, essentially by the new Labour government in Australia. Um, the Whitlam government uh, elected at the end of 1972, at the time that the Kirk government, Labour government, was elected here. Uh, and, and, and the Australians um, made it clear that they were going to litigate. Uh, and New Zealand had to become involved because New Zealand had a stronger record of... Um, of being opposed to nuclear testing uh, and going back to the late 50s when New Zealand uh, along with Canada but no one else really from the West supported a um, resolution condemning French testing in the Sahara before they moved to the Pacific. Also Australia had had uh, tests, British tests actually in Australia, in South Australia. Uh, so. New Zealand had the stronger diplomatic record and, and also was closer to the testing area and uh, the Cook Islands and Niue um, and Samoa were closer um, again to, to the testing area. Uh, and so we thought we uh, could develop a reasonable case um, on the merits. We thought we had a very strong case on jurisdiction because of a treaty that had been accepted by Australia, New Zealand and France and others back in 1931, and it was something I think the French had forgotten about, although they had invoked it um, in the post-war period. Um, and and so, uh, so we sought interim, an interim injunction or provisional measures and succeeded with that, but the French continued to test. Uh, they then um, uh, made some statements which we didn't think were uh, completely committing themselves to stopping um, atmospheric testing, but uh, that's how the court read it. And so we got a judgment at the end of 1974 saying that the, effectively that the case was moot. Um, so it was a very interesting process, but it needs to be put in a very much wider context. Uh, the government of the day, especially uh, Norman Kirk, Prime Minister Kirk, was clearly of the view that uh, nuclear weapons were a bad thing uh, and we should oppose uh, testing and other steps in terms of the development of nuclear weapons in all the ways that we could. And so following the grant of the interim relief, the provisional measures, a New Zealand frigate went into the testing area, for instance. There were appeals to all the governments of the world. There were appeals to trade unions all around the world, to churches all around the world and so on. And, and a little later, there was the development of the proposal for a South Pacific nuclear-free zone. So New Zealand did not see, has never seen litigation as being the be-all and end-all in that context. And, and we, after the nuclear-free um, legislation was passed in New Zealand in the later 80s, um, there was, in the end, wide, um, unanim essentially unanimous political support for that in New Zealand. Uh, and in 1995, during a national government, because they'd come around to supporting the nuclear-free uh, legislation, um, we went back uh, in respect of underground testing, which we thought, which it was thought, um, might vent, uh, might cause damage to the environment uh, because of the way we had pleaded our, we had pleaded our original case, which was wider than the Australian case, which was focused simply on future atmospheric testing. Ours was, was broader, it covered um, any testing that gave rise to radioactive fallout in the atmosphere or in the marine environment. Uh, so we, we thought in, um, uh, we would be in real difficulty on the merits in 1974, but we didn't, didn't have to <laughs> address them. And instead I, I undertook a different task in the 
1975, which was involved with the updating of the Geneva Conventions for the Protection of War Victims, which was another piece of major international law reform. The membership um, was arose from a recommendation by Sir Guy Poles, the Chief Ombudsman, who did an inquiry into the Security Intelligence Service. Uh, and he said one thing he had not been able to address was uh, the way in which um, the secret material was being classified. Um, and so that, that matter was, was then to be to refer, referred to a committee which had on it people from the Prime Minister's Department, or the Cabinet Office rather, um, the Justice Department, Defence and Foreign Affairs, and later Parliamentary Council. Uh, and then people inside the official system, on the State Services Commission, I should have said, people inside the official group said, we need some outsiders. And so Sir Alan Danks, who was an economist, um, uh, professor of economics at Canterbury and had a lot of government experience, a lot of experience in the health area, and I were appointed to that committee. And so it was a committee uh, of a, with people with a wide range of experience, um, only, a hand, uh, only a small number of lawyers on it, which I think is one of the real values of it. And uh, right at, the, at a very early meeting, the then Secretary for Foreign Affairs, uh, Frank Corner, who had served in early, his early years in the ministry or the department uh, in Washington and um, Westminster, uh, London, um, said, we have a basic choice. Uh, do we uh, stay with the position that exists in Westminster, that the Queen's papers are hers alone unless ministers decide to release them, which was our position at that time, uh, or do we decide, um, do we support the proposition in Washington that the papers of government are the people's papers unless there's good reason to withhold? And he stated that very elegantly, more elegantly than I have, and I think I've, I think I've quoted that in various places, maybe even in a judgment. Uh, and and we immediately went to the positive side, saying um, everything should be available unless. And in our first report, we were able to use a passage from the cabinet, um, uh, from the uh, uh, budget statement uh, of. Prime Minister and Finance Minister Muldoon of the day, um, which supported that argument uh, that the people should have access to government information um, uh, so that they can uh, assess it and be more involved and be more critical of it and so that they can be brought along if the arguments are persuasive. So, that's, so that was <clears throat> a, a critical starting point. Uh, then later on we had a a weekend long meeting uh, and Robin Williams was then chairman of chair of the State Services Commission. Now he, he was a man of extraordinary capacities. He was a great maths and physics whiz. He was, he was a member, he managed to get across the Pacific um, during the war uh, and was involved in the Manhattan Project, you know, mm. creating the first atomic weapons. Uh, he, he was then um, a vice chancellor of um, Australian National University, the University of Otago. Uh, he, he was, um, uh, and, and he became chairman of the State Services Commission. That's a very brief summary of this extraordinary man. Uh, and, and he um, very rapidly, he had a very different style of speaking from Frank Horner. He very rapidly at this long weekend meeting spelled out the way in which all this was to be done. He spelled out, well, the principle was established, the purpose was, being nutted out um, by uh, Jim Cameron from Justice and Walter Isles, uh, Parliamentary Council, uh, and me. Uh, we were starting to write this stuff. Uh, and, and then he spelled out the exceptions at high speed. Uh, and, and then we talked about the procedure for dealing with this. The Ombudsman, we pretty quickly decided, was the person to do it because he'd been, she, he or she had been doing that work uh, for some time anyway in a different sort of context. And then he said, I seem to have forgotten that I'm chairman of the State Services Commission. So, so it was a very exciting process. And we prepared a draft bill. Um, 
which was published. And that, of course, uh, and here you have officials giving advice, public advice to ministers and a draft bill um, attached. And then that led to some disagreement in the select committee which the bill went to. Uh, and um, Prime Minister Muldoon thought it would be a seven-day wonder. Um, Deputy Prime Minister McClay, um, who was also the Justice Minister, said he thought it was a major constitutional change. And so, it, as you said, so it's turned out to be. Um, and we, we didn't have very clear specific ideas of how it would work, but you know, but the, there are words, um, well, the, the reports of the committee say towards open government, you know, so we contemplated there would be a process. Uh, and and uh, the legislation also uses the word progressively. Uh, information will be progressively released. And it refers to the uh, cabinet conventions, conventions relating to cabinet um, confidentiality for the time being and so on. And quite quickly, um, parliamentary cabinet, rather cabinet papers, which once used to be held closely, were being released. That was also happening in the courts as well. So, so there, was, um, there were developments um, involving the courts as well as uh, the um, legislative and executive processes. Um, well, no, there could be a long story told on this, but um, uh, if, if I take um, a couple of um, events that occurred um, when, when we went to um, Europe in the course of our inquiry, uh, we'd already been um, bombarded by very many, um, been told about very many methods of um, election, uh, the preferential vote, proportional systems, um, additional member systems, uh, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and so we, we were getting a whole lot of technical detail about um, how elections might work. Um, we had not, however, really thought about the more basic question, what are elections for? And when, I, when we were walking through um, Westminster Hall in England, uh, to meet a group of people who were very interested in electoral reform, organised by um, Austin Mitchell, who had once been a political scientist here. He, he was a long-time member for Grimsby uh, in the House of Commons. Um, uh, we were, as we were walking through Westminster Hall, I suddenly remembered, in terms of my pretty limited knowledge of English legal history, that that's where the courts used to sit. You know, th it was where uh, Thomas More, for instance, as Lord Chancellor, would go through and he would go and kneel at the feet of his father, who was a judge in the uh, King's Bench or Queen's Bench Division at the time. Um, and, and, so, and, and then um, I found, um, when I was at Blackwalls in Oxford, a, a really good book um, uh, by Elton or Annan, I can't remember which of the two now, on Maitland. Uh, and that directed me to a Maitland um, uh, essay on the 1305 Parliament. And that, that essay is a very careful piece in terms of the great skills of uh, F.W. Maitland, a very careful piece on what that Parliament of 1305 did. And it did not um, raise taxes. It did not appropriate money for the purposes of the king. Uh, it, it did not um, pass any laws of any consequence. What it did was just settle disputes, you know, going back to my sense of walking through Westminster Hall. Uh, and then the third thing that, um, to pick out uh, some of the influences, was, was a discussion with Ralph Dahrendorf, um, a great um, German um, uh, politician, uh, political thinker, um, one time president of the London School of Economics, I think a member of the House of Lords, Lord Durandolf, um, a really great thinker. Uh, and I was talking to him at the New Zealand residence in Bonn, this is when Germany was still divided. Uh, and, and he said, um, the, the Brits had three good ideas when uh, we were 
um, moving towards adopting a constitution and they were still one of the occupying powers. Um, one, one was something to do with trade unions, another was something to do with um, Landa government, with provincial government. Uh, and the third, and this is the one that really stuck in my mind, uh, was um, uh, proportional, uh, was the electoral system. And the British, he said, said to them, well, having a proportional system is actually a very good thing because it means everyone's vote counts the same. Uh, and, um, but, he said, you need to have a threshold because otherwise you get in the kind of situation, and he may have mentioned Israel, I can't remember, where, you know, you get a whole lot of tiny parties unless you've got, say, a 4% or a 5% threshold or whatever it might be. And also, he said, it's very important to have local members uh, and, uh, and, and so that uh, there are MPs with local commitments and so on. Um, and uh, he also added to that, though, that um, list members, members are list, uh, on the party list, uh, might well also have strong um, local uh, commitments, uh, strong local connections. Uh, and he said, all of those ideas we thought were very good, and, and in particular the electoral one we took on board. <laughs> and uh, he'd been wondering ever since, when were the Brits going to pick up their own ideas? <laughs> uh, and so, so that was a critical moment. And, and, um, and so you find the first chapter of the um, Electoral Commission report, which again has the word towards in it, mm. towards a better democracy, I think is the title. Uh, and, and that um, says uh, that political parties should obtain seats in proportion to the number of votes, the proportion of votes they get, and that the rights, the, the votes of individuals should rank equally with one another. And, and so uh, that's uh, what we recommended. And then through various, for various political reasons, that, that got adopted. Now, one of the striking things about that process, if I could go back right to the beginning of it, uh, was that the fact that um, the politicians allowed a group um, of independent-minded people. We had a judge um, chairing it, uh, John Wallace. We had a political scientist, Richard Mulgan. Uh, we had uh, a Maori sociologist, Fetu Rama. Um, Fetu, uh, and and um, Richard Mulgan, um, a political scientist, and me, uh, and uh, and and it's you know it's, it's more or less unheard of for that kind of task to be given to an independent group, um, and uh, but nevertheless that happened. And to go back to the beginning, there was a, a very early meeting on the Marae at. Um, uh, Naro Hawaii um, with the Maori Queen present and so on. And, and Prime Minister Longy made a quite important, a very important opening speech. Uh, and then he was asked, uh, why, um, why, Prime Minister, do you go along with this business of having uh, these, this independent group uh, assessing this? I may have said something like pointy headed academics, I can't remember. Uh, and the Prime Minister, without without a pause, said, asking um, politicians, because the politicians had the vote, the question is said, um, asking politicians to design uh, electoral systems, it's like asking panel beaters to design intersections. <laughs> and that was the end of, the, <laughs> end of that argument. Uh, so, so it was uh, really quite an extraordinary process. And, and, it, and it took for 10 years, you know, it was 86 we reported at the end of 86, and, and then it was 1996 before there was the first um, MMP um, election. It should be PMM, actually, it should be proportional mixed member, but, uh, but that didn't, we couldn't make that change that late in the process. Uh, and, um, uh, and that had been through two referendums before, um, in 1993 and 1994, uh, with, uh, with you know, independent advice being given and a great deal of public debate about the systems. You were also a member of the um, Committee on Constitutional Reform, that yes. um, which recommendations led to the adoption of the Constitution Act. 
1986. Can you tell us anything about the nature of the discussions um, of the committee um, and around the time about the need of codifying um, New Zealand's constitutional arrangements and about what to codify and perhaps reflect on any lessons um, of that process for current discussions about further for the codification, for example, through the adoption of a, of a supreme constitution? Right. Well, um There was an immediate problem in uh, 1984 when uh, the New Zealand economy was in, uh, under real jeopardy uh, and the advice of the Reserve Bank and of the Treasury uh, and of the incoming government, I mean the potential government, um, because Labour had, had a very substantial win over the National Party, a very strong uh, body of opinion that there needed to be devaluation. Uh, the Prime Minister of the day um, was refusing to do that. Uh, in the end, he was persuaded, and, and that now becomes part of a constitutional convention um, recorded in the Cabinet Manual, that if um, there is a clear winner, <clears throat> then the um, government, if the old government If there's going to be a new government, uh, the old government will act in serious cases where there's no time for further deliberation, will act on the advice of the incoming government. So that convention was established <clears throat> more or less overnight um, by some very strong-minded uh, individuals who persuaded um, Prime Minister Muldoon, strong-minded me members of the National Court Cabinet, Uh, that that had to be the case. Uh, but we then, <clears throat> it was then realised that the law was unclear. It was unclear whether, new, whether the MPs um, who were leading uh, the Labour Party could be sworn in as ministers. It wasn't clear whether they were still members of parliament, for instance. And so that had to be clarified. Uh, and, and so a new constitution bill was prepared um, replacing the remnants of the 1852 uh, New Zealand Constitution Act, which had been amended over the years and which nobody had given much attention to for a very long time. And, and so what was produced was a pretty bare bones constitution, uh, which has the, the sovereign, it has parliament, it has um, the executive, um, and it has the judiciary in just a few pages, as you know. Uh, and, and so there was no great attempt to <clears throat> spell out anything very much. Um, uh, there were one or two points I should make about it, though. <coughs> um, <coughs> well, one, one was that it was um, <coughs> clear that um, uh, Parliament would um, continue to have powers, but it does not say Parliament has sovereign powers. It says... Parliament shall continue to have full power to make law for New Zealand. Mm. It's that effect. It's declaratory. You know, it's not constitutive. Mm. Parliament couldn't pull itself up by its bootstraps, <laughs> the advisers thought. <clears throat> And so, so there's that very important proposition. Secondly, there are, there are the minimal provisions relating to the judges. There are also provisions um, relating to money, uh, and to taxes. Uh, and in terms of the business of entrenchment, um, there was um, entrenchment of the three-year term. Now, the entrenchment <clears throat> that I refer to goes back to 1956, when the Electoral Act was amended uh, to provide that certain provisions, including the three-year term, the voting age, uh, the method of drawing boundaries, and so on, um, the secrecy of the ballot, matters of that kind could be changed only if there was a three-quarter vote in the House or a referendum. Now, that provision itself was not protected from simple majority appeal, repeal because in 1956 it was thought um, Parliament could not do that. Now, there's been an ongoing debate about whether uh, double entrenchment would be effective, but as a, as a matter of Um, long-standing now constitutional convention, uh, Parliament has always complied 
uh, with uh, those procedures, either with a three-quarter vote or with a referendum and making changes to those provisions, as it did in 1993 and 94, uh, when the referendums were held. Uh, earlier, there had been rejections of proposals to extend the term of parliament by referendum, uh, and there had been changes to the voting age and to various other aspects of the numbers of seats and so on by a three-quarter majority of the House. Uh, so, so there's entrenchment in that sense. Um, but, it, I mean, it depends on the good faith of, um, of, of those who operate the system, and it's now, I think, clear beyond any real doubt that <clears throat> all the constitutional actors will comply with those requirements. There was, for instance, a very important statement made by the um, Attorney General during the debates on the electoral um, legislation that went to a referendum, that the requirement of a majority of those voting in a referendum could not be altered um, to say a majority of those on the roll. Uh, he said that would be a breach of the understanding that had been long established. Uh, and standing orders also say that no bill can be progressed that proposes um, a, a new uh, voting, a, a high, super majority, uh, unless uh, the bill is passed um, by that sort of vote as well. So, so in that way, uh, the um, principles got established, but without uh, any thought really that they would ever get to court. Now there is a contrast with, with the work that had been done, say on the Cook Islands Constitution um, by, uh, for, by um, a member of the faculty here, um, Professor Colin Aikman, uh, where these, they do spell out in that constitution some of the conventions about the formation of a government. Uh, that arose from the fact that in 1964, when that legislation was being put together, uh, there was no, um, there were no political parties in the Cook Islands. So it was important to have confirmation in the House uh, that at, at the beginning of a new government, uh, that that government did have the support of the House. And, and do you have any, any, any comments on, <clears throat> on whether it is desirable or, um, or would you recommend to, to engage in further attempts of codification, perhaps, of codification of some of the conventions that, that are currently just generally accepted um, to exist? Well, they, they get um, reformulated um, in the cabinet manual, which gets reissued from time to time, and to which um, new governments, um, newly formed governments, commit themselves. And so the um, the cabinet manual, uh, let's see, was was essentially a private document or confidential document until um, about 1990, uh, when um, 1991, I think, is the, the first time it became really public, uh, and and uh, and then uh, the most recent version is um, 2017. Uh, at, at Uh, during the last year of the national government, and uh, I take it that it was confirmed by the new government in 1917, 2017, and and then again um, just recently. I take it. I mean, I don't have inside <laughs> knowledge about that, but uh, governments do commit themselves to the manual, and and that, of course, because of the introduction of um, a new electoral system. Um, In the, in the later 90s, uh, does mean that the conventions get rewritten and, and so agreements to disagree and so on, they get written in there, but they get written in with very careful attention and to, to write them into, into statute law would, I think, involve the courts um, in situations where it's better for them not to be involved. Um, You know, there, there was an unhappy experience of the Privy Council back in um, the early days of the Nigerian uh, independent state, um, in which they made a bit of a mess of um, understanding the Nigerian 
constitutional provisions about the formations of a government. Uh, and there have been other, ca other cases, actually in the Cook Islands, I sat on one, uh, where, where there have been real challenges about just how far the court should go. And, and, but in that case, as I said, the constitution does spell out some of those rules. So we had no option really but to try to make sense of them, but try to make practical sense of them because we had a certain amount of feel and understanding for the Cook Island situation. Well, um, we, we were careful in that to say that there did have to be a sectoral approach, but we thought there were some over there were some general principles, and and one of those principles is looking after various aspects of the economy. Um, one one of the pieces of legislation that followed fairly quickly on that was about animal health. You know what what happens if you slaughter a whole lot of sheep or uh, or beef animals. Um, uh, because of a fear of um, um, BSE or something or other. Uh, well, then there's got to be compensation provided to the owners of the herds, and, and that's been happening in respect of um, cattle, hasn't it, uh, recently. Uh, and, and so something of the same kind was to be seen in the very first reaction of the government um, this year and of parliament in passing... Uh, those supports for weight, for salaries and so on and so on. Um, so, so there are those sorts of ideas and, and there are, um, that apply across the board, but you need a sectoral approach. I think it's, it's probably, un it is unfortunate that um, public health legislation, which was languishing on the order paper for years and years and years, was never properly updated. And so we still have the 1956 Act, which in many ways can be related back to um, much earlier epidemics and pandemics, um, including the one in 1919, 1920, the, the, the so-called Spanish flu. I think it's unfair to Spain, isn't it, that it's got that title, but that's, that's how it's remembered. Um, and, and so uh, I, I, I wasn't here during the time of the Christchurch earthquakes and so on, and I don't know to what extent attention was given to that report, but. Again, going back to something I said about the Danks Committee, one of the important things about that report was that it was a, a, a report that drew on experience right across government and right across a lot of other agencies uh, and, and was interdisciplinary. It was not uh, just a bunch of lawyers trying to work out um, appropriate um, emergency powers. Um, now I have some questions um, about <coughs> your experience as a, as a judge, mm -hmm. um, mostly um, I mean, just domestically but also <coughs> uh, internationally. So you, you were appointed to the New Zealand Court of Appeal in 1996 and then in 2005 to the Supreme Court. You have also served as a judge of appeal in Samoa, the Cook Islands, Niue, at, at the Supreme Court of Fiji. And you were also a member of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council from 1998 to 2003. And then in 2006, you, you um, became a judge at the International Court of Justice. I wonder whether those, before those judicial appointments, um, I mean, you, you had different roles, other, other different legal roles as, as a law reformer and mm. uh, different um, parts of government. Um, I wonder, were you, were you always attracted to the judicial role? Um, did, you, did you ever ima imagine that you would end up as a, as a, as a judge in so many um, courts? <clears throat> no, um, I'd, I'd enjoyed the part-time judging I'd done in the Pacific because it started, um, well, let's see, um, nearly 40 years ago, actually, uh, in, in Western Samoa. Um, and and uh, I was involved in that case because I knew about the drafting of the Western Samoan Constitution and my two New Zealand colleagues didn't. Um, had we grown up in Samoa, we would have known it all. Um, but I knew about it because of the people, including, I mentioned him earlier, Colin Aikman, who had um, been involved in drafting that constitution. And, and the historians who had written a lot about it and so on, you know, so, so, so I, was, I was there in a way as a specialist and that was true in the Cooks and to some extent in Fiji as well. 
Um, uh, so I hadn't, I hadn't ever really thought of being a full-time judge. Um, uh, and nevertheless, I finished up being a full-time judge for nearly 20 years. So you never quite know <laughs> where, where the opportunities are going to arise or where fate will take you or something. You know. It's Yogi Berra's line about if you see a fork in the road, take it, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> so, so um, but but I, I thought, and um, when when the opportunity arose here, I'd, I'd been, you know, I did know a lot about the way courts work, partly from that very early experience, and also from the work that we were doing at the Law Commission on on court structure and and especially on criminal court procedure you know, and the rules of evidence and um, the way in which uh, criminal trials should be handled. Uh, and so we'd done a lot of work on that kind of thing. And I, and I thought it would be good uh, to get back into a situation where, where facts counted, where I'd be dealing with facts again, instead of dealing with the law uh, that uh, courts were to apply. Uh, and so, so when the, that opportunity arose um, in terms of a direct appointment to the Court of Appeal, I thought, well, yes, it probably is time for a change. I'd been, what, 10 years or so at the Law Commission. Uh, and and uh, it turned out to be not just 10 years, which, which I'd anticipated in the New Zealand courts because of the age limits and so on, but uh, another nine years on top of that um, in The Hague as well. And I, I'd also, through that time, Done one or two, done a number of arbitrations um, in particular areas of law, of international law primarily. Um, well, it, it's a it's a narrow job compared with um, academic and law reform work. You know, uh, academics, um, in a way, have a blank page in front of them. They they can set their own agenda, set their own questions and keep thinking about what is the right question and so on. In the case of law reform or constitutional reform, that may be partly true, but quite often uh, there will be a topic that you're given. But if it's something like emergencies or company law reform or something, you know, it, it can you can be engaged in a very wide search. Now, in the case of um, court work, especially at the appeal level, uh, the the parties have narrowed the issues. Um, you're concerned with a particular set of facts, with deciding a particular case uh, according to the law, uh, and simply on the basis of the facts that are, are brought to you through the proper use of the rules of evidence. Uh, and that that was emphasised in a nice way when the um, statute of the International Court of Justice was amended slightly in 1945 from the Statute of the Permanent Court of International Justice when it said, said the function of the International Court was to decide disputes brought to it uh, in accordance with international law, but to decide disputes brought to it, not, not to write an academic essay, you know. It's, uh, and, and one of the slight irritants in my time as a judge was that there are some colleagues, uh, both here and in The Hague, who... Um, think that uh, the pages of the law reports um, uh, is an opportunity to write an academic essay. Well, it isn't. Uh, <laughs> the job is to decide the case uh, and quite often to decide it on, on a pretty narrow basis. You know, you don't um, spread yourself widely when you're on the whole when you're writing a judgment, especially for a multi-judge court. Um, you know, in the case of the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court here and in, in the Pacific, it was three judges or five judges. In the case of the International Court, it's 15 or maybe sometimes 17 if there are judges ad hoc appointed to the court. If I think of, um, say, three cases, um, the Foreshore and Seabed case um, was extremely challenging. Um, and, and if you look at the dates, you'll see that we took, I think we took over a year to decide that. You know, it was, and, and that was in part because we, uh, in the end, persuaded ourselves that uh, the great judges of the 1950s and early 60s um, 
uh, had got the law wrong um, and that we were actually better informed, we were better educated, we knew more about um, early New Zealand legal history than they did. Uh, and, and so we disagreed with the rulings they'd made um, in the foreshore and in, in, in the um, 90 Mile Beach case, for instance, and to some extent in the Fonganu River case. Um, and and so, so that was a, a very difficult case and, and, and it led, um, sadly, I think, to an overreaction by the government of the day. Um, it, we, we released that judgment on a, on a Friday, which is fairly unusual for the court, and the press release was probably too short. Um, uh, we tried on the whole to, you know, keep the press releases short, but it, um, that one should have been slightly longer because we, we did not make final determinations. It was a matter that was sent back to the Maori Land Court to give further consideration to whether claims had actually been established. It was, the case was before us um, on a strikeout basis. Was there a legal basis for bringing this case? And uh, we agreed actually with a former student of mine in the Maori Land Court, Ken Hingston, who uh, sadly died just recently, that uh, he was right. And uh, that, uh, that the judges, um, in the 90 Mile Beach case, a very distinguished court of appeal, a set of judges um, were wrong, and but it took us a long time to get to that. Um, and, and another case um, was the Zowie case about the uh, um, Algerian refugee who was um, said to be a security risk, um, where we we dealt with two matters: one whether he could be bailed, and we decided he could be. Um, and, and second, um, what, what the law was relating to um, his release. Um, and we there um, uh, disagreed, uh, just to take one point out of that case, with the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, which when I read that decision, I mean, quite separately from the case before us ahead of that time, I thought was wrong. Um, and a former member of the faculty here, David Mullen, who was teaching in Canada said it was wrong um, and uh, the Solicitor General um, who had also taught here, Terence Arnold, now, now um, just retired as a Supreme Court judge, he, he refused to rely on it and, and so, so that was a, an interesting um, moment where you have very good academic um, commentary um, and a very responsible Solicitor General uh, deciding not to pursue an argument that was available. Um, and that's very proper behaviour by the Crown's uh, 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 second legal advisor after the Attorney General. Uh, and uh, another very early case was one about um, a membership of Parliament where we were in danger of getting involved in matters within parliamentary privilege. Um, uh, so that was that was quite a challenging case as well. So there were a range of um, really challenging cases, uh, but also a huge amount of um, pretty fairly routine case cases where people were exercising as they're entitled to their rights of appeal, and um, and we would deal with those cases um, uh, as fairly and independently as we could. Um, uh, through through the years, some hundred I don't know how many hundreds of cases I sat on, but there were a lot uh, in the, in the Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court was slower to get into action um, for one reason or another. Thanks very much. Uh, how are we doing on on time? We're just past one hour and three minutes. Twenty, perfect. Thanks very much. Um, good. I think we're. Are doing well. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, now, as a judge in the Western Samoa Court of Appeal, uh, one of the cases you heard had to do with the, with the constitutionality of the provisions of the Samoan Electoral Act that at that time limited the right to vote and the right to present oneself as a candidate for elected office to a particular segment of the population. <coughs> Can you tell us? Um, about the, the complexities involved in that case as you, as you saw them? Yes, well, the, the voting was uh, limited to the chiefs, to the matai. Um, 
And uh, going back to the point I made earlier about um, my knowledge of the Constitution, I, I knew that um, that issue had been a critical one all the way through the 1950s. Um, Western Samoa was a trusteeship territory until uh, 1914 or 1919, it was a German colony that came under New Zealand's um, uh, control as a mandated territory under the League of Nations and then a trust territory. And all the way through the 1950s, as it was moving towards independence, there were debates about uh, the suffrage. Uh, and um, at the um, 1959 and 1960 constitutional conventions, which were attended by a widely representative group of Samoans, no lim not limited to the Matai, uh, the question of Matai, that Matai limitation was debated uh, and a decision was made by the conference uh, to maintain that and to say that um, only uh, the chiefs could vote and only the chiefs could be uh, candidates. The, um, the, the trusteeship council persuaded the Samoan and New Zealand authorities that a Bill of Rights should be included uh, in the constitution. And what was included was in large part um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without, however, the provision about the right to vote. Um, so that had been omitted. It did, however, on the other side, have a right to equal protection of the law, a right to equality. And, and so the um, Chief Justice of Samoa, um, who was an Australian, um, decided that equal protection uh, of the law required that everybody could vote, which meant that um, the Electoral Act was invalid in his view, uh, and it also <laughs> raised real questions. This is, what, 1981-82, about all of the things that have been done since 1960, uh, since governments have been elected on, on that, that basis and laws have been passed and judges have been appointed and so on and so on. Um, but he didn't actually address the consequences. And so there was an appeal and... Um, uh, the court that was made up of uh, Sir Robin Cook, as he then was, and uh, a, a retired judge, uh, uh, Justice John Mills, and me um, on the basis that I knew about these things. The, the, at the same time, there was a case in London about, um, privy ca about citizenship um, of Samoans um, before the, on appeal from the New Zealand Court of Appeal. Uh, and it's, there's an interesting contrast to be drawn between the judgments because the um, Privy Council held that a great number of um, Samoans were New Zealand citizens, something that had never been contemplated as a result of legislation passed in the 1920s and 30s um, at a time when, it, as I said, the, it was a mandated territory. But anyway, going back to the uh, case I was on, um, the, the court... Um, read all this in the judgment. I'm not elaborating on the judgment in any way. Uh, the court began with the proposition that um, uh, the constitutions were to be approached um, not, not according to um, a narrow approach, but were to be seen in a broader context. The context included Pacific, um, other Pacific constitutions, um, uh, and they expressly conferred the right to vote. Uh, the um, a mission the court thought was significant. Uh, and, and then at the end of the judgment, there's an interesting reference to the fact that this matter had been debated uh, at the Constitutional Conference and that that, had, uh, that um, decision had been made. And it would, I think the court said something to the effect that it would be artificial to ignore that. And that's, I mean, that's interesting in terms of <clears throat> the attitudes of New Zealand courts towards the use of Hansard or legislative history, because at that point, uh, New Zealand judges like Australian judges and British judges uh, were not looking at Hansard, or, or at least they said, uh, said they weren't looking. I mean, they didn't cite it. I think in some cases they were, in fact, looking at Hansard, but that's beside the point. And so we were cautious, that Court of Appeal was cautious about that, and... and um, and so we preferred um, custom, uh, in effect, uh, to 
some reading of equality before the law. Uh, just one, one other point about that case. As we were heading off towards um, uh, RP at, for the hearing, we invitations kept arriving from all quarters in Samoa uh, for us to go to parties of one kind or another. And, and my two colleagues said, we can't possibly go to parties. You know, it would be quite inappropriate for us to go to parties. And the people there would bend our ear and so on and so on. And I said, we, we can't possibly refuse. Um, we must go. Uh, otherwise, we'd be seen as Palangi mm -hmm. outsiders who didn't understand the local culture. And I said, I was pretty confident about this, that the people wouldn't talk to us about the case anyway. We'd have a very good time. And um, the German brewery had just been reopened and it was this great Vilema beer, you know, which would cool the very, very hot days because uh, the days were, were very steamy up there um, at the time of the hearing. Uh, and so we went to the parties and had a thoroughly good time and no, and no one misbehaved. <laughs> and so, so that was that was part of um, part of our cultural understanding and cultural awareness, uh, which which I knew about because some of these some of the Samoans involved had been students here, uh, including the Attorney General um, uh, Narani Slade, uh, who um, uh, was lead counsel for himself uh, in that case, with Colin Aikman, uh, drafter of the constitution as uh, a junior, and Yash Guy, um, very distinguished Indian um, constitutional lawyer, who was at that time at the University of the South Pacific, um, also appearing. So. It was a very lengthy process. The, the government made the decision um, I think three years ahead um, of the election that um, New Zealand would have a go at uh, this and that I would be the candidate. Um, I was, <clears throat> there's a, a system of nomination in the statute of the International Court that um, provides for an independent body. The, there's a national group that in New Zealand regularly consists of, um, uh, of, of the Chief Justice, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, and in the past, um, uh, an academic, and I was the, I was the academic, I suppose. Although by then I was actually a judge, but, um, and and more recently there's been another judge in that slot, um, and I of course didn't participate in that uh, nomination process. Um, but then then it was a matter of um, very um, diligent um, campaigning because it's necessary to get elected to have. Uh, a majority vote both in the General Assembly and in the Security Council. Uh, and and so lining up those votes required a huge effort. We began pretty well with the Pacific Island uh, Forum um, coming on board. Um, uh, and, and then uh, the uh, Canadians were extremely helpful in Francophone Africa. The Australians were helpful in various parts of the world. Um, we had, we had good support um, from the APEC countries, the countries in the Asia-Pacific Economic um, Cooperation Area with um, a good number of, um, uh, of Latin America uh, supporting me. I, I was competing um, with a Spanish candidate uh, and, and it was pleasing to get um, support from, uh, from, uh, Latin, uh, from mm -hmm. countries that were former Spanish colonies. Uh, and I, when I went to the Dominican Republic, for instance, um, they were very pleased and they, they were a bit dismayed that they hadn't yet been really approached by the Spanish uh, authorities. Uh, and so, so I visited um, more than over 30 countries. Uh, there were huge efforts in New York um, over three years um, uh, and, and great efforts by embassies and, and by uh, by politicians. Um, Helen Clark was Prime Minister at the time and uh, she once when when she was head of UNDP and uh, I was looking after her in The Hague, um, we went to Delft for her to buy something for her parents uh, and um, 
uh, she she got into a very interesting conversation with a young woman there who had just done a course in international relations, and uh, the PM and the former PM said not too many jobs there. I guess at the moment because the American economy was in difficulties, um, and and then uh, Helen said you should know who this person is. He's very important, and I say said you should know that she was. Uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand for nine years, and she and Helen said, and his leading campaigner, <laughs> and so, so it was a huge effort by ministers um, uh, and and by diplomats, um, and and in the end, uh, we got the votes, and um, I actually finished up with more votes than Tom Bergenthal, who was running for re-election uh, in the in the Assembly, but more votes and. Also, more votes than the Russian, who was a, a new member on the court. Uh, so that was a great effort by the New Zealand uh, diplomatic corps and by, as I say, by ministers. So, so it's quite a process. Well, <laughs> you know, you have fifteen judges from fifteen different countries and from greatly different um, traditions. Um, so lots of lots of civilians, um, uh, including, well, the Japanese so had had gone to Cambridge as well. I mean, lots. I mean, a lot of a lot of the judges um, uh, had been to European and North American universities um, at at the graduate level, or sometimes for their initial law degree. Um, so so there was. But there was still a, a, a sort of civil law, common law divide. Um, but uh, that, I think, had been disappearing over the almost 100 years of the court's life. You know, it goes back to 1920, that court. Um, and, and so there was a lot of uh, common ground. And a lot had been created by the work of the International Law Commission. So the convention, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which is not unlike our Interpretation Act, now incorporated in the Legislation Act of 2019. Um, and and so, so there's a lot of common ground and, and the Law of the Sea Convention was another that was quite often before us, or law, the Law of State Responsibility, which had been subjected to very careful work by the International Law Commission. So there was a lot of common language in that sense, but there was still the very challenging business of getting a, a judgment together. The the process, uh, which I've talked about in some detail elsewhere, um, written about, uh, involves at the end of at the end of the written proceedings, or even during the written proceedings, the court can start thinking about asking questions of the parties and uh, suggesting issues that they might like to address. And that was done in a few cases, probably not in enough. Uh, uh, at the, um, in the in the course of the oral argument, questions are asked, but they're not asked in the way that they're asked here in the, a New Zealand court. They're asked in a rather formal way at the end of a session and so on. Um, but then the deliberation um, has a number of different phases. Uh, and the initial, one of the very early stages is when uh, the members of the court get to write a note on what they think the real issues are, and how long, um, uh, and and how how they see that being resolved, that particular issue. Uh, those notes, which varied in length, in my experience, from five pages to 120 or something, um, got translated into the other language. The court works in French and English, uh, and and then they're they're debated from the junior judge up the table. Mm. Uh, and that's a process that can take three, four, five days of six hour days, 10, 10 to one and then three to six. Uh, and, and at the end of that, the president of the court, who gets elected every three years, um, decides uh, uh, where the majorities appear to be. Um, he's, he and his assistants have been keeping very good notes. Uh, and. Um, and then suggests who might be on the drafting committee, and there's a drafting committee usually of three, uh, and they pr they produce a draft which um, can then be uh, the subject of written amendments. They clean it up, clean the draft up, 
produce a, a new version, which is then the subject of a very lengthy deliberation, going through paragraph by paragraph, with them being the principal paragraphs being read out in both languages, uh, and and that process can lead to amendments or the rejection of amendments or um, the drafting committee thinking about it over lunch or overnight uh, and coming up with changes. Uh, and then at the end of all of that, the uh, judges who are going to write separately or dissent um, indicate that and they have to produce a new their version of their draft opinions in time for the drafting committee to produce a second draft. Uh, and that's usually the dispositive one. That's the one that uh, has worked through and uh, may be amended on the, on the run. Um, and then at the end of that process, people have to vote yes or no and it becomes public on the particular points in the, in the dispositive and the judge, final judgment of the court. Uh, and then the parties uh, and the, the court itself clean up their texts uh, and uh, parties get notified uh, of the time when the judgment will be given. So it usually takes uh, six months uh, for that process, sometimes a good deal more. Um, and sometimes, you know, there will be a further deliberation if um, the court hasn't really quite reached a conclusion. So it's a very exhaustive mm -hmm. uh, and process of an, and it involves the whole of the court. You know, those who are going to dissent, um, they may indicate that very early, continue to participate mm -hmm. in the process. So, so it's a very lengthy process. Interesting. And and would you say your experience or your, or your knowledge uh, of New Zealand law gave you any particular insights um, that were helpful to the resolution of, of any cases at, at the at the Hague? Well, I, I think, again, it goes back to the point I made earlier about the way in which um, processes of government work, and in this case, the processes of courts, you know, that you you have to spend an awful lot of time trying to get on top of the facts. And and the facts in these cases uh, can be can be facts that last over a very long period of time. You know, I began and ended, as did other members of that court, uh, with cases from the Balkans about genocide. So the first was Bosnia against Serbia, the last was Croatia and Serbia with Serbia making a counterclaim. And and there the facts, horrific uh, facts, um, you know, extended over several years and they had to be stated and evaluated. Did they um, indicate that genocide, or were we convinced that genocide had been uh, committed? Um, and we said yes in respect of Srebrenica in the first, but not more generally. And we found no um, uh, evidence of genocide in, in, in the second case, the Croatia-Serbia one. Um, and, and in other cases, um, like the, um, the Law of the Sea cases, there would be very technical um, uh, geological and other evidence uh, that we need to assess. So, so getting the facts right, mm -hmm. Uh, was something in common with what had happened here, except they were facts that very often were much more extensive. Uh, and and the court was dealing with those facts at first and last instance. And and there was this very large body of judges, mm. many of, quite a number of whom were not all that interested in facts. <laughs> and, and then there would be the business of trying to work out what the law was. Um, although, as I said earlier, the law quite often was um, uh, pretty well understood. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there were challenges in the case of maritime delimitations when you get 200 mile zones overlapping, um, say, in the Caribbean, or we had one case between Peru and Chile um, overlapping in, in the Pacific. It was good to have one case from the Pacific. Well, we had the whaling case as well, mm. where. <clears throat> There were also also issues about getting the facts right and um, and just trying to work out what the law was and what the role of the court was and and dealing with um, uh, the International Whaling Convention. Well, I I don't think it's a totally helpful idea. Um, you know, if, if you look at it from the international law point of view. All that the Charter of the UN talks about is sovereign equality. 
And you can't have nearly 200 states being sovereign. They're not sovereign, they have sovereign equality. They are equal. I mean, that's obviously, as a matter of fact, pretty debatable, but at least in terms of the law, that's the um, situation. Uh, and, and domestically, um, you know, um, as I indicated earlier, the, the New Zealand Constitution Act does not say that Parliament has sovereignty. It, it continues to have full powers. It's a declaratory provision. I know there's the provision in the Senior Courts Act that talks about uh, sovereign, the sovereignty of Parliament, but it also talks about the rule of law. You know, so you're left at the national level, you're left with that contrast that um, is to be found in Dicey. And I recently reread uh, Dicey, who's after all talking about the constitution of, the, of England. Um, I've reread it and he claims to be able to square um, parliamentary sovereignty with the rule of law. Well, and, and with the conventions of the constitution as well. Well, you know, good luck to him. I don't know that that works. And, but just going back to the England point, you know, he, he ignores the fact that um, uh, there was an agreement reached, there's an act of union, a treaty of union uh, between Scotland and England, and the Scots have never accepted that um, parli the parliament at Westminster could do whatever it liked. They've managed to avoid it. And one of the real issues, real skills, I think, in basic constitutional matters, and you know much more about this than I do, uh, is to avoid those very basic questions. You know, um, uh, may, maybe scholars can talk about them, as you have, but, but uh, for judges and practitioners, it's better to uh, uh, skate by. And, and uh, you know, and, and another <clears throat> aspect of this in terms of England, or in terms of the United Kingdom, uh, is its one-time membership of the European Union. And there's a, there are a couple of judgments um, in the House of Lords, the Factor Tame case and another case, in which uh, the House of Lords um, uh, sort of put to one side a United Kingdom Act of Parliament <laughs> because it was not consistent with uh, European uh, law um, in respect of fisheries and other matters. And, and it was for, for the scholars in that case, for Bill Wade um, to, to say, you know, there's a constitutional revolution going on here, there's a new Grund norm. Well, judges can't say that, but uh, mm. that, that um, is, is the way in which uh, these matters move on. And, and if, you know, if you go back further in the case of um, the British Constitution or the New Zealand, or well, take the New Zealand Constitution, it had, uh, the New Zealand Parliament had full powers to make law for Western Samoa, for the Cook Islands and for Niue, it doesn't anymore, you know, and, and the, the Western Samoa Act 1961 says we have no more power to pass laws for Western Samoa. <laughs> uh, the Cook Islands Constitution did provide that um, for a while that New Z the New Zealand Parliament could make laws at the request and consent of the um, Cook, Cook Islands authorities. Um, uh, and, and that itself is a constraint, of course, on the power of the New Zealand Parliament. But then the Cook Islands Parliament removed that from their constitution. You know, and and if you if you take, you know, if you go back to 1776 or, or thereabouts, <laughs> you know, you think of the extent of the British Empire. Well, come come forward to 1920, you know, when the British Empire is at at its fullest extent. It's uh, the UK Parliament on the face of it has power over a quarter of the land mass of the world, a quarter of the population of the world, can make law for all of them. But now, I mean, it's, it's a, a greatly shrunken authority, isn't it? So, so the reality um, in terms of sovereignty, I just don't think it's a very helpful concept. There's a line of um, James Crawford now in the International Court of Justice in which he says, you know, you can use it, but it, all it means at the international level is that it means that it's um, the authority that, that a state has has left to it uh, once you take into account its international obligations. Um, mm. And that's true even of the largest, mightiest states. Um, they mm. don't have authority outside their, 
um, powers and authorities. Well, I, th I think on that I've, I've actually had a consistent view. I've changed my mind about some things, but uh, one of the very first pieces of published writing of mine, um, I, I, I suggested that the Treaty of Waitangi was binding at international law. Uh, and, and since I wrote that, um, uh, there's been stronger and stronger support for it. You know, the view, the view that um, it was not valid internationally was a view that was taken um, in the 1870s here. And it was a view that was consistent with a very narrow view taken by scholars, actually not by practitioners, um, uh, at that time that uh, international law or the law of nations applied really just um, to European countries and countries that had been colonised by Europe, which had recently become independent, um, the, the Americas particularly. Uh, and I mean, there were questions about China, Japan, Thailand, I mean, this, um, Persia, this, this is a, a rather, Siam, I guess, rather than Thailand. Uh, this is a pretty peculiar, narrow view of the scholars. But um, uh, a, a student quite some years ago did research on the basis of the consolidated treaty, treaty series here. And, and he discovered a large number of treaties that had been concluded in the Pacific. Uh, and um, they took the form of treaties. They were published in the European treaty series of one kind or another, De Martins and so on, British and foreign state papers and so on. Uh, and, uh, and you find these treaties being dealt with as treaties. And you find debates, say, relating to the status of Samoa um, and when it was divided and so on between Germany and, and America. Um, you find debates there on the basis that these are treaties. Uh, and uh, I, th I think I referred back in that 1964 or 5 article uh, to um, a decision of the International Court of Justice that had been given in the late 50s in a dispute between um, uh, India and Portugal. Um, uh, there you find references to treaties concluded long before between Portugal and, and, and the Brits or between Portugal and local princes. Um, and, and then coming well on to my time on the international court, um, uh, there were cases relating to treaties between the East India Company and the Sultan of Johor, which we dealt with in that court as treaties. And so, so the practice um, is, denies the rather narrow view of scholars. Uh, I also, um, at some point in my work, a long while ago, I think on the Treaty of Waitangi, discovered a treaty concluded in West Africa between the British West Africa Company, I think it was called, and chiefs in Sierra Leone in which some of the very same adjectives mm. and terms are used as were used, it was the Treaty of 1835, I think, as were used in the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, and, and that treaty, um, first of all, takes sovereignty, it uses that word. Second, though, protects the rights of the local chiefs and so on. And third says, um, you have the rights and privileges of British subjects. You know, the same three mm propositions as you find in the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, and, and so, so the, the use of the word sovereignty or kawanatanga in the first article uh, doesn't really mean a great deal or the word sovereignty doesn't. Once you take account of the fact that Article 2 uh, protects rights and Article 3 um, confers rights and privileges. Rights and privileges in Maori and the Kafiri translation, I think, but actually it's in, um, it's rights and obligations in one one or other of the texts. Uh, and and there was a case in eighteen in nineteen twenty five in which um, an international tribunal tribunal dealing with a land dispute in New Zealand that went way back into the eighteen forties um, decide distinguished between uh, the rights the sovereign 
rights of, of the state in respect of its territory and, and the uh, rights um, of ownership, a, a distinction between um, the dominium and, and uh, uh, the patrimonium and so on. I mean, you know, law does distinguish between different types of entitlements in respect of territory. Uh, a state may claim sovereignty over its land, um, but then ownership may belong to you and me. I mean, there's uh, uh, of, of a particular piece of land and there are the, the decisions of the um, US Supreme Court that were well known in New Zealand in early days of colonization. Uh, and so, uh, and so one, of, one of the last most recent pieces of writing I did uh, picked up the last sentence of um, that article, um, which I published back in the 60s, uh, in which I asked the question, given that people didn't think this treaty was effective at international law or national law, um, perhaps it should be treated as a contract. Mm. Uh, and, and so I wrote about that in, in a, a, at a conference in honour of um, Dame Sean Elias as she was retiring as Chief Justice. And, and there's a very good decision of um, the Native Land Court back in 1870-something, uh, Chief Judge uh, Fenton, in which he deals with the treaty as a contract, uh, referring to consideration you know, exchange of promises and so on. Uh, and, and it could be seen as a relational contract, you know, not as an immediate mm. contract to buy, say, a glass um, or to buy the water that goes in the glass, uh, but it's a relationship that runs on and, and that's something that you find uh, in quite a lot of scholarly writing about different types of contracts. Thanks very much.